Melvin, mate, you all right? Hello, mate. How are you doing? Not bad. How are you? <laughs> Good. Good well, stuff. Thanks. Sorry, sorry I'm a bit late. No, nah, no bother. Uh, appreciate it's early doors, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, we're an hour. I'm an hour ahead over here. Uh, okay. So. But you can still say it's early doors. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in Germany then, yeah? Yeah, I live in Germany now. Okay, what took you over there? My wife's German, and right. uh, we, yeah, we um, we met in London, but we lived, um, we lived, yeah, lived for a long time in London, and then decided to come over here. Okay, cool. Whereabouts here? I might not know. But... North North Germany, not too far from Hamburg. Ah, okay, right, yeah. Went there on a stag do a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Didn't exactly see much, to be fair. Well. Nothing of, of that anyway. <laughs> oh, it's um, a nice place. Great, it's a great town. Yeah, it's a great city. Actually, we did do some decent uh, stuff in the day. Like we went to St. Pauli's ground, did a tour of that. Yeah. That was good. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it is an interesting place. Yeah. I'd like to go back. I've heard it's actually pretty, yeah, away from all the Reaper Man and stuff. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's got the harbour and everything. And um yeah, I haven't done that tour, you know, of the San Pauli ground. I did a tour of the the other team, the Hartis Foul, the um, Hamburger, the the one, uh, the other the other team, basically. Yeah. It's actually a bit the, the bigger team. Just, I mean, I think in the UK it's just called Hamburg. Mm. But um, I did a tour of that ground with my son. A few, yeah, a couple of months ago, that was good. But oh, um, cool. yeah, Sam. Yeah, they're the, they're the two they're the two big teams. There's actually a few other teams as well. There's a couple of other smaller teams there, um, but those two are the bigger ones. Ah, okay. Um, how old is your boy? I've got two boys. One's nine and one's seven. Ah, okay. So they did did they were they born and and raised in Germany? Though? No, they 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 were both born in the UK. Actually, they were both born in London. But they've since you know since they've we've been here now for. Six, seven, yeah. How long have we been here now? So, yeah, and then six years, six years this year. Okay. So, um, yeah, they my oldest remembers London quite a bit, but my youngest doesn't really. All oh, right, do they see themselves more as German now? Then, yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, I think they, <laughs> um, yeah, they 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 definitely, um, yeah, they go to school here and they've got that whole sort of environment now, the German environment, but they they definitely connected to the to their English roots, definitely as well. Um, nice. My son is, uh, yeah, he's, he's a big football fan, and he's, and I've sort of moved him in the direction of Wolverhampton Wanderers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But he's so. I mean, he's, um, yeah, they've got that. Uh, they've they've definitely got that. And I, I mean, we're all we. I'm always reading to them stuff, you know, and um, and with you know listening to music and everything. So they've got that. Um, they've got that connection too. It's quite different, you know, because there's a very different, um, there's a lot of things that are similar to the UK, but there's a lot of, you know, between the UK and Germany, but there's also a lot of differences, you know, in terms of um, humour and that sort of stuff. And hopefully that they'll, they'll get some of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm always jealous of anyone that's that's bilingual. To be fair, if they're growing up with both languages, yeah, they, they are. Yeah, they are. They can, they're, they're fluent in both. And since they've been since they were babies, you know, my my wife's spoken German to them all the time, and I speak English to them. That's it. They've always known two languages. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned Wolverhampton. Is that the area you grew up in then? Oh. Yeah, I grew, I grew up um, not far from Wolverhampton in. Uh, in between Wolverhampton and Stafford in the Midlands, yeah. Okay, right. And you know, when I was talking to Lasser, I don't think we really established how how you met each other. But I, I guess before that, he mentioned that you you were in other bands before the Rex. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I was always in bands since uh, since I was quite young, really. At school, uh, I started really getting into music when I was probably yeah, maybe twelve, thirteen. I didn't start learning guitar until till Nirvana, till right. Kurt Cobain. Really, that was that was the thing. That because I had some guitar lessons when I was like even younger. I think maybe about nine or ten. But I wasn't into the guitar. I wasn't into it at all. But then, um, as soon as I heard Nirvana, 
that made me want to. So I got my mum's old guitar and started playing that, and that's what really got me. Yes, going in the direction of the guitar, but I was yeah. But before that, I was definitely into music. Um, you know, started going growing out of the pop stuff, if you like. You know, listening to the now now that's what I call music compilations, and then starting to find a bit more of your own. Uh, you know, in, indie stuff really, like the Stone Roses. I remember having a compilation with. It was, I think it was a compilation called Loaded, and it had. Um, yeah, Prime, I think Prime Screamer on there and Happy Mondays, that sort of thing, you know, those, those sort of bands. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Um, and yeah, so like where, I think last I mentioned that the early formation of the band was you, him and another person. Like, <laughs> but where did you yeah, actually meet true, each actually. other? Yeah, that's true, actually. I forgot that until he said it, but he's right, yeah. There was, there was another guy that was a flatmate of mine. He was, um, he was I think he played bass, yeah. And he, he was... Like the first, that was the first rehearsal we had when me and Lass had played together. Um, probably that might have been like early two thousand two, something like that. Um, but yeah, he he was yeah. He went. I think I don't know what, what happened to him, but yeah, he didn't <laughs> uh, didn't stick in the band now. Uh, okay, but where did you meet Lasser then? Um, Lasser and, and I met actually in. Uh, through the shop I worked at, Jamie and I, Jamie and I met first uh, at a shop I, we worked at in Covent Garden, and then Lasser was yeah his sister his sister was our boss. Okay, so, all right. And, um, so, and then yeah he 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 then and then Alan was like Alan was the the last last to come on board really. Right, right. And what took you to London? Was it was it university or not? No, no, I went, I, I actually went to university in Cardiff and then after I'd, I'd finished uni, I basically thought, well, what, what am I going to do? And then headed to London to, um, yeah, just to look to look for work. And I had a few, a few different jobs when I was in London. When that was never, like, that time, early 2000s, yeah, very easy, just got some got some work. London wasn't that, that expensive. I had, like, a, a, had a little, very small room that I rented. Um, so yeah, that was that was all that was all pretty easy. Okay, cool. Um, and you know, Lassa said, I think he was in, he was inspired by the likes of the Strokes. Is that the same for all you guys? Yeah, I mean that 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 is. I mean, going back, I'm talking about you know, I'd been in different bands and I'd been in different you know, at school. It was like an indie band. We played Live Forever. We played uh, Flame and Lips songs, a couple of our own songs too. Um, and then when I like met people and did some music in London before I met the lads in the race, then it was, yeah, it was sort of like, I was always playing guitar, but then once I'd heard that, is this it record? Yeah, that was like a big, that was a big deal. I think that album, even though I was a bit older then already, you know, I was already 24, probably when I was 25, when I, yeah, 20, maybe, how old was I yet? <laughs> no, a bit younger, but I, I, you know, I wasn't like a teenager when I heard the strokes. Um, but that was a big, and Lasser was a was a fan. Jamie was a fan. Alan also, yeah. Okay, great. But I'd um, say the the um, if if yeah the, those that that the, that band coming along, Strokes was obviously a big deal. Um, Alan as well was a big fan of the Streets, so okay. I reckon I reckon the Streets and the Strokes could be to blame. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should have been called the streaks yeah that would have fit. <laughs> yeah, fit there we go in answer to your question what do you what would you do differently call the band the streaks there we go <laughs> you could mash up band that actually see what yeah, interesting that's, in. but, that, but that that is i mean those are those are two two bands we were into yeah if the streaks is a band yeah yeah <laughs> and i'm all right in thinking I don't know if Lasser said it or I read it somewhere that Alan initially was going to play guitar as well. Uh, I think he, no, I don't think that was, I mean, maybe when we first had a, like Alan's went to Alan and Jamie's place and then Alan did have a guitar. Yeah. But I don't think, I don't think that was ever really on the cards. Okay. Right. Um, and you know, Lasser said it was all pretty organic that you'd end up, you know, writing a song pretty much every practice session. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when when we had our first session, uh, first 
um, they got together in a, in, a, in a rehearsal room. Yeah, that was the setup, you know. Uh, last drums, Jamie bass, one just me on guitar. Um, maybe Alan did pick up a guitar, I can't remember the first one, but we, yeah, the first session we, first, we did play a song, we wrote a song. Um, and that was, actually, I always say this, but the, from that first session, I just thought, yeah, this, because I'd had the experience of being in bands before, thought yeah this is a good match this works somehow yeah do you get just get that feeling where it's the right dynamic kind of thing yeah totally totally it was the totally right dynamic yeah between the chemistry they say don't they or something like that (laughs) (laughs) but that there was yeah it worked it worked we uh, we wrote a song it sounded good write another yes yeah and then yeah, in terms of songwriting, was it quite democratic? Like, how would you bring something to the table, or would Alan bring something? Well, else? I think I think um, the songwriters in the band, for me and Al, right, we 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 brought the original ideas into the band. Um, as a, in terms of getting how it sounds, you know, if you listen to a rake song, that is a, the rake sound is that that is the four of us put, you know, the 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 four of us played together. So there's definitely that, that um, it would have sounded different if we were in, you know, if there was someone else on bass or someone else on, on drums, totally. So we definitely had, there was a, there was a dynamic that produced the, that sound. The original song ideas came from me and Al, I would say. Oh, okay. And what about in terms of riffs then? Would you come up with a riff uh, at first or would it come after, after the initial yeah. song? Well, the good thing about our, certainly our first record is that there was not a definite way that songs would be written. Strasbourg, for example, I wrote that, yeah, had these, that's quite strokesy, you know, that's quite strokesy guitar riff at the beginning. But obviously the lyrics are to- totally different to anything the strokes would do. And that was my first idea because I'd been, I, would, I think I'd w- watched something about the, um, the Stasi in East Germany. So that was just, and also listened to, I was listening to Luke Haynes' album as well, about that he did called Bader Meinhof, which was like, he did a concept album about terrorism in the 70s in Germany. So I was listening to that, and that, then I got these first ideas for Strasbourg, brought it to the band, then we like, we didn't have a chorus, so we sort of cobbled the chorus together with a few chords, and then Alan then took it and then developed the lyrics for the, the last verse. So that was a real, that's a different, yeah, that was one way a song was written. Okay, cool. So you would share the responsibility with lyrics then? Yeah, well, not always, no. I mean, all the songs that Alan wrote lyrics for, they're all his, I would say. Uh, when I wrote lyrics, I was a bit more yeah, hesitant, or perhaps you might say lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just basically... I, 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 wasn't you know I'd have like the sketch of an idea, whereas Al would always have a pretty much a clear, you know, like story or whatever it was that he that he had. And um, Twenty Two Grand Job was that, you know, that was the that was like a, and I, he came to the studio. Al did with this Twenty Two Grand Job in his, you know, so this is this is the idea for the song, and then we just that again, you know, written in what we written in about an hour, I reckon, probably less. I yeah. mean, like the, to get to get the sound of the band, but Al had been Al had been working on the lyrics. What was what we did at that because we were a democracy. We said, okay, and you know, does anyone want to change some lyrics to to this? And then we all had to go at writing something for twenty two grand job. But it, it, thank God we stuck with Alan's original idea. It was really good. <laughs> yes, um... and the riff the riff for that the riff for twenty two grand job. Um, we had, you know, we built, we, we just basically chord in the verse and then like change chords in the in the chorus, and that riff was actually, I mean, I was then I was inspired a bit by um, Pixies guitarist. I mean, you wouldn't think it listened to that track, but there's a bit of Pixies in there. No, I can, I know what you mean. That riff, yeah, I can, I can see the Pixies in that. It's yeah, a, yeah it's that, that 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 was, a, and I think in that song, in terms of what that song really works is as well as just the, what it's about and how Alan sings it. Also the, it's really short. It starts with a drum roll. I think that's really cool. Starting with the drum roll <laughs> yeah. because I mean, you don't think about that at the time, or maybe you should think about it. If you are a songwriter writing songs probably is a good idea, 
but it works well at the indie disco just when you hear that <laughs> it does it works well and i think um the other thing we did with that with that um track was we did a key change at the end just like just like boyzone did in the 90s in eternal all those 90s bands they always at the end they always just take the just do the key change and that's why we did it on 22 grand job <laughs> It's, yeah, you know, it's pop. It's pop heritage that song. It's oh, it's excellent. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Clearly, a big fan of it. From uh, as you can tell. <laughs> well, I think most 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 people, if you ask them about who, you know, if if someone's heard of the race, yeah, uh, then that's it. You know, twenty-two grand job is it? Is the song? Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I was gonna say. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I guess I didn't really talk much to Lassa about how you actually got signed or what the process was there. Yeah, so we uh, so we had our rehearsals. Uh, we've got got some songs together. First thing was getting gigs, um, which we just arranged ourselves. You know the, that that sort of circuit in in London. We don't, we only played in London at the beginning. We didn't go anywhere. Else. We just played in like bars in London. Um, but as I put on Twitter the other day, it was um, the windmill in Brixton. That was our second gig. The first gig, we didn't invite anybody, just to make sure that uh, <laughs> we did. We just, I mean, maybe a couple of people in we knew came, but basically we just played to an empty room. We were like first on, supporting some other bands on that on the on the, the regular gig circuit. I think it was in Highbury Islington upstairs at the garage. Yeah. There was just we just played to see if we could actually do it on stage, and then the second one was at the windmill, and that was that was really good. Okay, cool. Um, Great. Then. So how yeah, how do you, I mean? Lassa mentioned you had a manager that kind of uh, attached himself to you. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that was uh, our manager was a friend of Jamie and Alan. He basically said, yeah, he'd, he'd been in bands himself um, and thought, and was like, okay, I'm not going to do this myself, but I still really, he was into the, what, our, what we were doing, our sound, um, and obviously thought, yeah, thought, okay, we could, he could do something, take it somewhere. So, yeah, we did. He, he then, then once he got on board, then we just got more gigs booked and he started then to sort of look at the possibility of talking to labels. But that was probably... You know, we formed in 2002, the rates, like probably summer, two, early, um, earlier maybe, 2002, rehearsed for like till 2000, maybe it was May 2003, our first gig. We didn't get signed, or we didn't, well, we signed a publishing deal, I think, in 2004. And I think the record deal must have been signed, yeah, maybe 2004, 2005. So we did a lot of gigs in between, loads, loads and loads of gigs. Yeah, yeah, yes. and yeah, I did want to ask you. That, about, has that, answer, has that answered your question? Or not? <laughs> well, now I'll ask more about labels. Uh, yeah, as we go, but I did. I did want to ask you about being the only guitarist. Like, was that an uh, was that a responsibility you enjoyed? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm great. I didn't have to say. I didn't have to. Um, I could do the lead and the rhythm. <laughs> You just like I, would have, I, would have, I would have been the lead singer as well, but that's just not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, the um, the the guitar that was that was that's a good thing because if you just if you're just the only guitarist, I think you've got to be a bit more inventive. And we knew when we started out, we weren't going to be playing so many. We, you know, we were we weren't going to be sounding like Coldplay. There was all those bands, wasn't there, in between Britpop and in between Oasis blowing up and then our thing in the uh, in the 2000s but then there was all these bands in between and that was like that was the indie sound then Travis and Coldplay and that obviously wasn't going to be us and that's why the Strokes were were at least sort of got got you sort of got a lot of people going I think yeah yeah and from but those, being in... but those sorry go on no go on sorry I was going to say those sort of that sort of style of playing in the rakes when I was in my school bands as well, and we were writing songs, and I was playing riffs on the guitar, that was probably similar, really. Because I remember, I remember uh, um, when I did play someone twenty two grand job from school, um, when we just done a demo of it. He said, "Wasn't didn't wasn't that riff? Didn't you have that like when you were doing playing at the uh, 
at the grapes that was a pub we used to play at and it was like probably is the same riff actually <laughs> yes yeah because i was gonna say like from being in other bands did you know how you wanted to sound when you got to the rakes kind of thing like obviously the the records and the live stuff sounds very full even though it's only one guitar like did you know how to get the most out of your guitar at that point well live live yeah live definitely because um you get that it, when you rehearse and you get the feedback you say okay you can hear you can hear it and it's it's like okay you just sort of the, what the dynamic of the band gives you an idea of how you should be playing and then recording is a different thing because when we did do the recording of Strasbourg, there's obviously double tracking on there. It's not, there's no, I mean, that first album is not, not at all a live album, not far from it. It's a very produced record. Um, lots of thought got into it, obviously into the production. So yeah, um, totally different things, I think, live and live and uh, um, recorded. Okay, yeah. And then, yeah, just, just looping it back in with labels and like, yeah. Yeah, how did that all work to the point at the point where you got signed? Okay, yeah. Um, well, we had a few labels that were interested in us. For, as I say, first we signed our publishing deal. We signed that in a Weatherspoons in Nottingham. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, that had to be. You know, that, that was the that that was the that was the first thing we signed. So we had a publishing deal, um, and then we had a few labels interested, and then in the end, it was V two. That, yeah, I think it's again the people that were there. There was a chap who signed us called Malcolm, and he is a, an A and R man, really top guy. Seemed to get the band, and that was that was it. You know, that was why we signed for them. I think. Okay, cool. And was it a three album deal? Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Just what uh, was it? That, yeah, yeah, it was. It wasn't just like a, a, a one. It was a, a sort. Of, I think it was like a rolling thing. Definitely ah, okay. two. Definitely two with the option, and then they took they took up the option for the third. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. It was a yeah. It was a, it was it was at the time. I guess it was a pretty. It was a pretty good deal, in terms of you know you, we got an advance. I mean, I don't know what the sort of situation bands would find themselves in now. Probably not getting the sort sort type of deal that we got then. And a lot of bands got then. So, yeah. I mean, I remember. I remember when we signed our publishing deal. I mean, I that someone saying, "Oh yeah, Razor Light. They just signed for a million, a million quid publishing deal." So that was, yeah. There was, there was a lot of there was a lot of interest in the, in bands. You know, getting bands signed. No, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. I think Lassa mentioned that. Is it your manager who's quite good with the money? Kind of like <laughs> made sure you weren't going to blow it, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, I think we, we, we put a lot of effort in to get to that position to be in to actually get signed. When I got, when we got signed, my main emotion was relief. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was just like, uh, we signed that the record deal, and then I just sort of like left the well, left the office where we'd signed it, the record company, got on the bus. It's like, yeah, okay, that's good. Got that record deal now. <laughs> that was like. And then, so we were always, we, you know, and there was, I mean, we're not talking like loads and loads of cash here in terms of, it's just enough to keep you going. Keep yeah, you going. yeah. Late, later on, when you get more success and you get start being paid good money for gigs, then yeah, then you can actually start to re reap it, the rewards and say, yeah, okay, I'm making some money now from this. But uh, then it was, you know, obviously we were still we were still working in in, in in day jobs as well at that time. You know, when we signed up publishing deal, we'd we'd do tours, but then we'd there was still you know it wasn't enough to be to be living off. Okay, right. So what point what point do you suck your job off when you get signed? I think yeah, I think I stopped um, working when I was when we we so end of two thousand and four. I stopped stopped working. Right, wow. <laughs> Not, <laughs> that's it and. Uh, yeah, that was, that was, um, that was it. Yeah, yeah, that's a mad but moment. In terms, of, in terms of you could, in terms of saying, yeah, now this is what I'm doing as as, as this, this this is this is what I'm doing as my job now. I'm in a band. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, you shared some cool photos of recording with Paul Epworth, um, mm. and, La and Lassa said that you know it's a very 
well, it's the most exciting time we've had in the studio. Is that, is, yeah, that was good with, that? with Paul. Yeah, it was brilliant with Paul. Yeah, um, we did we did two. That that whole recording was done over two sessions. Um, the first was a week, and that was in two the early two. That was in two thousand and four. It was a week recording where we did Strasbourg. We did oh, what else did we do? We did We Are or Animals as well then, which we pretty much wrote in the studio that track. Again, that's an Alan lyric, all that, that, all that whole song is an Alan lyric with the idea with, which came again, again, sort of like 22 Grand Job, that song's written. Lyric, a chant, then, then the drums, and then building up everything on top of that. So we did that with Paul first of all, and we did Strasbourg, um, and then he went off to record. I think he then went off to do Block Party in between, and then came the, in the autumn. We then went and did two weeks in like in a residential studio with Paul, and did the rest of the record. Okay, including yeah, a, a, including a new version of Twenty Two Grand Job because originally, as I, as I again I posted that I think um, the first Twenty Two Grand Job we recorded was um, in uh, yeah in, a, in Mute Studios, and that really was recorded live. Yeah, that was and that's the that's the vinyl. That's the 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 first first single we released yeah i was going to mention that yeah because you said it was the closest you got to capture in the live sound or something yeah definitely i think so i think because it literally was recorded live um in the middle of a run of gigs as well so yeah really yeah. really got that um that live feel i think and, okay. uh, and the b-side as well the b-side is called something clicked and i fell off the edge and that is also, yeah, really sounds good. I think, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't listen to the rakes every day, but if I'm sometimes, <laughs> if um, just uh, every other day, but, um, <laughs> if, if I, I uh, if I um, listen to them, then listen to that. I like listening to that vinyl sometimes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And yeah, with Paul Epworth, I mean, obviously gone on to be massive. Did you get the impression, you know, that he's going to be very successful? I suppose. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I think he's he's really like he's very very enthusiastic about what he does about music. What he made when we were do, we did our first um, songs with him, you know, those that that for that first week, he gave me a CD with some influences of of, of his own, you know, to say, and then what he th that on that CD were like. What was there was like. Daft Punk is playing at my house, and that that also that um, La Tigra remix remix that I mentioned that was uh, on yeah. there. So that was the that was the sort of DFA sound that he was obviously quite into, um, but also things like Eno as well. And you know he's obviously a real big music fan. So and yeah, I'm not surprised that he went on and did did so well. Yeah, yeah. No, like it's interesting. Like quite a few bands obviously around that time recorded with him. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, I pre I mean, I prefer his version of the Baby Shambles recordings as well. I think they're, I think they're great. Um, yeah, I I'm, I don't know much Baby Shambles stuff. I don't, uh, I don't, not that familiar with it. But it, it's, it's, is that Kilimanjaro? Is that him? Yeah, that he did that one. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. That's great. That's a great sounding record. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, he mentioned in an interview that uh, you're a bit of a boozy band, and I put that to last one. He said, "Yeah, that's a fair comment." <laughs> yeah, of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. That 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 was that was the uh, that's how it was with us. Yeah, it was, yeah, it kind of just embraced it, kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was. I mean, the thing is, all that stuff is it's all fine, but you've got to produce. You've got to produce the goods. You've got to produce the music. That's the thing, and you've got to play well live. And we did that, I think. So um, anything else around it is, yeah. I think the main thing is what what you actually, you know, how how what you produce really. Yeah, yeah, like work out, play out. I guess is it. Yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think it's just you, you do have we did have to we did have to do a lot of gigs. We did have to do a lot of playing, and the more you play, the better you get. And it was and we liked doing it. You know? It was the yeah. main thing. It was it was good. And Lassa said, you know, you, you had a uh, good relationships with other bands, but you never he never really felt like you're part of a scene. 
No, I wouldn't say, no, I didn't. I, I, I agree with him there. I don't think we were. I don't think we were part of the suit. We certainly weren't with that whole. Although, if you, if you read stuff at the time, you know, Whitechapel, East London type of stuff. Jamie did live in East London, yeah, but I mean, we didn't. That whole libertines thing, that wasn't our sort of world. Um, and we didn't sell anything like the libertines, obviously. I think Carl Barrett once said to Jamie, you, you nicked our name or something like that. Or you, you've ripped because a rake is obviously also another name for a libertine. All right. Apparently, I mean, apparently you did someone say that to Jamie. Um, but we didn't actually have any idea that we were stealing the that I that concept from them we, we just we thought it was a funny name to be honest with you it was a, it, we had the name first before we had any songs <laughs> and it was it was actually a bit of a joke in fact a lot of people didn't re realize that we were actually when we actually played I think I don't know what they were expecting some friends that came to see us but I don't think they were expecting us to actually have some songs written that sounded all right <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah i think i think it was a bit that we, yeah we didn't take ourselves too seriously when it came to that sort of stuff no yeah you get that impression i said to lassa like <laughs> i think bands like yourselves and art brute had that uh that good self-awareness where they could just have a bit of a laugh at yourselves kind of thing yeah i mean you still you still have this you still like want to you're still aware of like you're, when you're on stage and what it means to be in a band and all that stuff and i think everybody in the band is aware of how they're coming across but um yeah i mean i think alan was really on stage as well like we used to do some alan used to like do quizzes on stage <laughs> and give away prizes <laughs> he gave you know it was so there was an there's it's a bit vaudeville really some of the stuff that Al was doing so it was it definitely which is funny because some of our songs are quite serious in their subject matter and then we had this sort of like almost uh, taking the piss type of thing when we were on stage so well yeah you're right Art Brew had that too yeah yeah and I think their I, I think their their lyrics are very quite again quite different to us in the way that they're you know, yeah what the subject matter is. Oh, yeah, you mentioned like the interviews and stuff, and um, I was reading the one you posted on Twitter, which is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> like the Accrington Stanley's comment made me laugh. Yeah, I don't. Well, <laughs> I mean, at the time, that probably was probably people would would have got the reference. Did you get the reference then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming it's just uh, yeah, made up band for the gag purpose. Well, what the what it is actually is there's a. Um, there was an advert in the yeah, 80s. Yeah. Do you remember? I mean, you're probably not old enough to remember it, are you? No, but, but yeah, I've heard a reference yeah, a lot. You've yeah. heard a reference to it, yeah, with Ian Rush. Yeah. And it's an, it was an advert for milk. And then uh, they say, you know, who are you going to be playing for? Accrington Stanley, who are they? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that's showing my age there. <laughs> but yeah, I think Lassa mentioned, you know, you'd always come up with different... Uh, different stories for how you're formed and stuff to keep things interesting. Yeah, we did. Yeah, again, that was part of that sort of not taking yourselves too seriously. Meeting on meeting on a on a stag do was actually one of them. Meeting on a on an easy jet flight. Um, yeah, for a go go all going on separate stag do's. <laughs> I think that was one was meeting at London Zoo. I can't remember what the context was there, but there was definitely London Zoo involved. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and then is a it's a Tom Cruise thing real that people would actually did it, a girl actually stop Alan asking if he's Tom Cruise? Yeah, yeah, I, that definitely happened. Yeah, with that that whole That's Tom, funny. That definitely, yeah, that that definitely that happened around that time. I think certainly around the time we just started the band, and yeah, it was in Argos, and someone genuinely thought it was buying Tom Cruise was buying a toaster, <laughs> and eventually rode Argos. That's it. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, just like trying to link in some of the questions people are asking. Um, yeah. Someone was asking about, I better get the name, haven't I? Uh, all too, yeah, Raya Kitchen asked about All Too Human. Um, he's saying it's uh, criminally underappreciated, but was that, did that become, did that come around in between albums, that song? Yeah, that was like a, 
Um, thing is, with, with us, when we didn't write loads and loads of songs. You know, we we wrote when we you need to do a gig. You needed you needed maybe eight or nine songs. So we wrote eight or nine songs for a gig. Then for an album, you needed maybe ten or eleven. That's talking about our first uh, first record. So we wrote those, and then we had the other songs. That, that became b-sides so we need yeah, well we needed b-sides so we had other tracks that we wrote but we didn't have like 30 40 songs so with all too human whether we needed a song for certain needed a new song or it was just i remember it being written with with in with the idea that we would be putting out another single which it was um yeah so it was like it was in between it's sort of in between the it's in between the first and the second album okay yeah. i was watching that's the a video. very that's a very that's long-winded that. answer to your <laughs> i was watching the video yesterday and uh looked like you had a lot of fun doing it i think yeah, that do you know what yeah i mean it was it was like a whole concept using the dogma film i think um and it yeah it was it was good it was good fun to do but uh I think looking. I think looking back, some of our some of the videos, you know, I would have liked to have a bit more us to have a bit more. You know, we come up with some ideas, but to have a little bit more input into it, really, not just go along with it. The rec, you know, this is people from the record company come along and they're like video production company. Yeah, let's do this, and then you sort of go along with it. But um, I think it's important to like try and be on top of all of the stuff. You know, we, on the videos. As I say, some of the ideas came from us, but when I when I when I think about them, I think that we could have perhaps been a bit more, yeah, and a bit more of an input into them. Okay, yeah. Well, last I talked about is it Strasbourg where you, you, you mate filmed it in a house or something? Yeah, that was in, that was filmed in Alan's flat. Okay, that right. Was in Alan's flat um, with us just sort of yeah messing about really. <laughs> uh, right, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's. Um, yeah, that, that that's that's pretty DIY. I think it's quite quite fun. Yeah, yeah. And then I was reading on enemy.com that you played like an Adidas house party. I was just interested in how you know I talked to the Paddingtons about yeah the odd corporate gig they would play. Did you get some yeah. offers like that? Obviously, yeah. Yeah, we must have played. I mean, we did play those sort of gigs. We, play, I mean, we played probably the most rock and roll one was playing one in Paris for vitamin water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that was yeah that was that was what we did where we sort of you got you played and you could you do you mind putting a, some vitamin water on the stage yeah okay so there it is you put your vitamin <laughs> water. um yeah and we did adidas yeah adidas we that was in the u.s because we had some a promote a, a promoter there or a label there that was putting out our stuff and they had this connection with adidas and they said yeah it, we did some gigs and then all got all got some free stuff nice <laughs> yeah. i think lassa said you um you flew, you flew all the way to japan to play one gig at some point is that right yeah we did we we, we played a um a festival in japan ah, okay that was yeah that was yeah one flew there did the gig <laughs> flew home <laughs> <laughs> that was good that was good yeah i mean the we didn't go to japan that much but um that was like yeah we got chased down the street yeah i'm always fascinated by the japan stuff yeah i mean we were we you know i think when we played there we were supporting block party we never did our own tour over there but it was it was fun yeah it was good yes yeah and what about in america like did you did you build a bit of a following over there? Yeah, definitely. When we played in LA um, and New York, that was always really good. In between, you know, that bit in the middle, that was a bit more, uh, the, you know, it, that depended on on, on, what, on like who we were playing with, when it was. But we did we did one pretty big tour, which was about three weeks across across the US, where we had like a, a proper bus. And that was that was good. Our, our bus driver was he was a bus driver but his his day his other job was a bounty hunter <laughs> right yeah he, was, he said to me well, i was sitting up there at the front in the with the bus and the bus at the front and uh he got out his gun massive magnum and said yeah look here we go just in case i've got this just in case 
So <laughs> that's where we get. Yeah, land of the free and all that. <laughs> um, and yeah, just another one on enemy that come I found was uh, something about a text message based treasure hunt gig at the social where your amp blew up. God, you have been doing your research. Haven't you? <laughs> yeah, um, quite intriguing. Yeah, that, that was that, that was that that's that was a promotion. That was to promote our, our second record, where you had to do um, you had to do a treasure hunt. The the you had to log on and do the mail. You had to register for the mailing list, and then you got this these text messages that took you around London, and you ended up at the social and the rates and the rates played, and <laughs> my amp did blow up. Yeah. Um, not the yeah, not probably not the the greatest thing to happen, but yeah, I think we had a spare one. It it, it went it went fine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, apparently, Alan was doing some talking heads karaoke or something to fill his time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Alan was good at that. Alan's really good. I mean, you could actually you could just go on stage and you could let him do a bit of do his do his do his act. <laughs> um, and then so, oh, and then we could play some songs because people love to. It's just brilliant. It's just brilliant when uh, people really love to to see to see him do his thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then when it gets to the second album, uh, you know, I talked to Lasser about it being this producer that produced Arctic Monkeys, but it wasn't yeah. wasn't a particularly great fit with you guys. Yeah, that was. Um, I don't think you can say that actually that it was. I think if it's a, like a combination of factors, we had it was Jim who Jim Abyss who, who did who did those tracks with us, and I think that whole thing with the second album again, as I said, we'd never had like a load of songs. What we should have done is perhaps spent a bit more time and really got really decided okay what do we want to sound like on this second record but we just sort of rolled on writing writing and um yeah i don't know if if i don't know if i'd say jim wasn't a, wasn't a fit for us i mean he produced he produced the songs that we had in a way that sounded yeah as the records at that time did yeah i mean we could we you know we, we we didn't have a clear we didn't have a clear like vision for a sound how we wanted to sound on that record. I would say we didn't even, even on the first one, you you know, we always knew how we sounded live, but then the producer's role is very important. And that's what Paul did on the first one. What all the producers do, they always, you know, bring something to it. And uh, yeah, then I think the second record just suffered from, from the fact that we didn't really quite know where, what we were doing, where we wanted to go with it. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because I was listening to it this week and thinking you can hear it's more like you can hear influences from other bands a bit more clearly on the album, I think. Yeah, what like who? Um <clears throat> it's just different bits like it's almost a bit like the Walkman at one point. Um Yeah. I mean I I, I don't suppose at that point there'd have been an influence, but there's a bit there's one that's a bit more like the Mystery Jets kind of thing. I guess it's just a bit more varied, I guess, the sound. Yeah, I mean, we. The thing is, like the the second one, the second record. From my point of view, when I was writing songs for that, I was in a quite a different headspace to where I was writing the songs for the first record. Probably in a more chill, chill like relaxed headspace, but that doesn't always produce the best sort of songs. And the ones there's quite a, there's a few tracks on. There's, there was always the case of the race. So there's some songs that I just wrote all the song. It's like open book on the first record. And there's a couple on this record too, but I think what worked the best in the race is like a good sort of like uh, back and forth between myself and Al. And maybe and someone said to me as well, you didn't really have that on that second record. And probably fair point. Okay. And I mean, Lassa said, I think someone asked him, you know, if you have to rank the albums in terms of how happy you were with them, he put the third one. Do you agree with that? Third, he'd, well, he'd, he'd put the third one at the top. Yeah, as in the as one that you felt that you're most happy with. Well, I'd, I'd go, I'd go for the first one. I'd go for it because I think it's the songs on that record really. I think there's some really good tracks on it. I think across our across across our whole when I think about a whole uh, discography, <laughs> and 
um, I think, yeah, there's some good stuff all, all across it, but uh, the, the, the first one is a real statement, I reckon. Yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant album, and a lot of people... Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people asking about a re-release. Uh... Yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's, a, that's a good idea, yeah. That's a good idea. It all depends on what the situation is. I'd have to, I mean, I'd have to speak to the record label, because it's, it's a matter of rights. It's a matter of who owns the rights. And even though we signed those, signed that deal ages ago, the deals, I mean, they're just not fair to back, fair to the musicians. I'm not going to sit here and moan about being hard done by a um, band member, but, they, you know, it, it, should, it should at some point come back. It will come back to us at some point. But I think now would be a good time for us to maybe could think about putting a, um, putting a reissue out of Capture. If there's people that want to buy it, you know. No, definitely, people, yeah. um, if there's people that want to buy a vinyl reissue, of um, capture release by the rakes, then yeah, I'd, I'd definitely get try and get that sorted. I would. I think it's quite hard to get hold of, you know. Yeah, it's not that many. It's not that many. Yeah, so I think yeah, I don't I've, I've got one. It. You can have it for a million quid if you want. I've got one. <laughs> well, I'll let you know, mate. If my crypto takes off, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's get in some questions then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm glad right. to see. It's, I'm glad to, just to say, I'm glad to see it's go. Thanks for having me on, anyway. And I'm glad to see it's going well. This podcast. Oh, cheers, mate. Yeah, like, uh, I'm not sure I, I expected it to be still going three years on, but yeah, it's uh, it's been. Is good. it three years now? Yeah. What, three what, years. Made, what made you What made you start it? What was your What was your thoughts then about it originally? Uh, well, it's a bit like. Like you say about the Rake's name, the the name came before the podcast, really. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and it's just an idea I had. It was before lockdown, and I was just like, uh, it'd be a good idea for a podcast, like seeing where all these bands are now. And then when Zoom kicked off in lockdown, it was like, I could, mm -hmm. actually, could actually do it now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just gave it a go. And obviously Tom from the Paddingtons, who we know from a whole, uh, he had a few connections that I didn't have, obviously. And uh, got yeah. some got some good people in to start it, and then it just kind of snowballed a bit. Yeah, he was he was on the first one, wasn't he, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they always speak, you know, like him and Lloyd always speak really highly of you guys. And uh, I think even Marv was asking if uh, <laughs> he'd be up for touring again at some point. Yeah, what well, the the rakes? Yeah, with the Paddingtons. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, I don't, it's a it's a difficult one. I don't I don't think that there's going to be a us getting back together and going out and play i mean you ne you never know how things go out and go in the in the in the end but i think yeah it's it's unlikely those those gigs we did though with with the with the paddingtons they were brilliant yeah. they were really good yeah yeah very yeah, i mean a, a lot of people are asking about reunion stuff but uh yeah, I guess. yeah, and I thought. I mean, as, as I'm pleased to hear it. You know, I'm pleased to hear that people ask about it because, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's nice that people still are listening are into the music that we made back then, and still are interested in what you know the rakes as a as a thing. Uh, it's not a guarantee, so I think it's this. I mean, that's the thing with the, the vinyl issue. I think that's something that that's more. That's something that could happen. I think. Yeah, yeah, that'd be brilliant. Like it's in nearly, it's nearly twenty years, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, we we as I said, we formed tw twenty one years ago. The band. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that should happen for sure. Um, and yeah, Brian Joel, I think we've already answered it really, but he's asking which one of yours, which one of the albums is your favourite? But you're saying the first one. Yeah, I think the first. I think I'd say the first one. Yeah. And then Matt G. I had tickets to the cockpit in Leeds, but you split beforehand. Why? I was gutted. Luckily, he went to the loft in Castlefordshire, and it's one of his all-time favourite gigs. All oh, right. I don't remember that gig. But I think, yeah, we could come and see it. See us at the, at the cockpit. That was a, that's a good... Yeah, right, mate. Sorry, the connection went a bit there. 
Okay. That's uh, a, is that? I didn't get uh, didn't get the answer to that question. Sorry. Yeah, I said to well, Al, sorry that we didn't um, that we split up before he saw us play or saw us play that time. Yeah. Castleford yeah. Gig, yeah, Castleford gig. I can't remember that one. Uh, I suppose better touch on why why I did split up. Uh, Lasse said it was probably more complicated than the statement made out, but I don't yeah. know. I don't know if there's anything you can really talk about or not, really, I guess. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't really want to really. I don't see the, yeah, yeah. the need to, to, I mean, the, the, the thing is, if we came, just no matter what we, you know, what was going on in the band between the, the four of us, I mean, being in a band is a pretty, like, high intensity situation. So, I mean, the main thing was, I think if we really wanted to carry on then, you know, after those three records, no matter what was going on, we could have found a way to somehow go, go forward. But I think the momentum was running out. I think it was, it was, it was going. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, Josh, Dick, Josh Dixon was asking about that, you know, infamous uh, Reading Festival where uh, yeah. you, got, you got other people to sing in, in place of Alan. Uh, good memories of that? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean... Obviously, it was it was good because we could play the gig. We wouldn't have if if it would have been, I wouldn't have done that whole gig myself singing it. Um, so we had we thought okay, I, I was I sang a couple of the songs, but we were like okay, how can we get how, what can we do here? And then we asked around, and people were up for it. So <laughs> it was yeah, we had. Paul from Maximo Park come on and do Strasbourg. We did. We had Kelly come on and do Strasbourg. Uh, yeah, done different dates. Um, one at Leeds, one at Reading, obviously. Um, yeah, and then at the twenty-two grand job at the end with everybody on stage, that was that was brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> magic. absolutely magic. It was really fun. Yeah, I've heard. Uh, I've heard the recording of twenty-two grand job, but I guess the whole gig must have been recorded. I wonder if it must be. Yeah, else. I don't. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I'd like to, I, yeah, maybe the, the, somewhere that probably could is in the archive somewhere. Yeah, yeah that'd be but, awesome. Yeah, it, it's quite funny actually hearing that. I've heard that myself. That um, I think it's on YouTube that um, <laughs> yeah. everybody, everybody's doing 22 grand a job. <laughs> um, and yeah, was it Lassa? Is it Lassa saying like Towers of London will really begin to the Rex? Yeah, they're big Barracks fans, yeah. yeah you know, Tales of London, I, I, I mean, say what you want about their, what, how they were, you know, the, what they were up to. But they were always top lads to us. They really were. We, they, they really loved the Rakes. Um, and they, especially 22 Grand Job, obviously, that was their, that was their, they loved that. And I think we played, we had the same management company, so we got to see them just we just hung around with them sometimes, <laughs> hung out with them sometimes. So that was, yeah. And I thought, I thought, I always thought that, um, yeah, them coming on to do 22 grand job as well with everybody on there was good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully the uh, the documentary will be out this year, I think, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be interesting. <laughs> uh, protect. On Instagram. Thing is that, I mean, Sorry. what would you rather watch? Sorry, I was just going to say, what would you rather watch? I reckon um, watching a documentary, that's going to be entertaining. If you could pick any band from that era, what who to make a documentary about in terms of just pure entertainment value, then you'd pick them. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, I I had the directors on here, so I like, managed to like, get a, okay. a, pre a preview of it, and it's, it's brilliant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember, do you know, I remember a photo, a seen a photo of um, Dirk and Donny from the Towers sitting outside Noel Gallagher's house. Okay. Yeah, they, when, they, when they were like teenagers. Oh, uh, right, okay. They had, their, they had a guitar and they'd sent to Noel, this was a story they told us, but there's a photo of it somewhere. I mean, I don't know if it was in Enemy. I think it, might, I think it was published in Enemy when they, when they were the Towers of London, but they don't look like the Towers of London then. <laughs> Just, you know, they, they're there on his, at Supernova Heights and they're waiting outside and with the guitars. And apparently then Noel came down, they played him a song, What Do You Think, Noel? Yeah, it's all right. And then <laughs> gave him some advice. But I love, oh, I love that. 
I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully get one of them on at some point. That'd be great. What, what uh, one of the, the towers? Yeah, like there could yeah. follow the followed me on, on Instagram. So hopefully you can get him on at some point. Oh yeah, definitely. That'd be yeah. Um yeah, E Protect on Instagram says, Is there a is there a best gig you played in the northeast of England? Um best gig and well actually I, I think I, when I when I saw that or a couple of when when they tweeted before about I do remember Sunderland gig a very early gig in Sunderland and I don't remember the venue it's like a bar really it's a bar that was really good and then Newcastle we played Newcastle with the Buzzcocks that was good all right cool but they were yeah I mean I really liked playing in the northeast it was um, is Hull technically the Northeast or not? Uh, it's East Yorkshire, but yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> well, we played obviously up there, didn't we? Quite a few times too. Yeah. But yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put myself put Hull up there myself in terms of like the, that being the Northeast. When I think of Northeast, I think of yeah, Newcastle more, more and Sunderland and maybe York, I guess. But we played York a few times as well. Okay. Yeah. Was it Fibbers? Was it over there? Yeah. F- yeah. York Fibbers. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. Cool. Um, Tonkin, nineteen eighty four says, "Did you ever have a twenty two grand job?" Did I? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I did. Maybe not quite. Actually, no. Maybe not quite. <laughs> I think that wage was like the at the time in London was something that you know you could you could actually live on in London on that wage pretty much because Alan actually had gone for a job that. That was his whole, that is actually, this is a true story thing, that he did actually go for a job for 22 grand um, and didn't get it. If he had got it, he probably would have sacked the band off. <laughs> so, um, thank God he didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he's actually, he's act, I mean, you'd really want to speak to Al about this, but the uh, the 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 lyrics about, yeah, the office things, that was that was from his, because he did have an, another an office job and that was obviously taken from that. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I think Lassa said the idea for the video for 22 Grand Job was um, combining the office comedy program with, uh, what did he say? <laughs> with something yeah, else, that, basically. Yeah. yeah, it was one of these, oh, I can't remember the name of the video. Yeah. Um, oh, Call On Me, that's it, yeah. That's it, Call On Me. It was the Call On Me video in the office, yeah. I think that's <laughs> it. I think that was the, that was the concept. Yes. Um, then... Ninu Shakaif, sorry if I've said that wrong, said, I saw you play Glastonbury back in the day. Any interesting uh-huh. tales of festival debauchery? Um, I've got one image of, from Glastonbury, which is of Lassa um, wading through the mud um, with, his, with a really long trench coat on. It was like a scene out of uh, All Quiet on the Western Front or something. <laughs> he looked, you know, because he had the haircut. And that, that rather than anything is an image from me of Glastonbury. I thought it sort of could that could have actually been taken um yeah in the in the trenches. It was pretty it was it was uh that was the image that I've got of that that of Glastonbury then, yeah. <laughs> Other than that, no, I can't yeah. If you can remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> um then yeah, speaking of Lasser, he says uh why is Matt the sexiest rake? Oh, is that oh, is that what Lassa says? Yeah. He knows he's the sexiest rake. He just wants me to say, no, Lassa, you're the sexiest rake. <laughs> so I'll say it again. <laughs> you're the sexiest rake, Lassa. And then, yeah, then Jamie comes in with one and he says, uh, is it true that Matt appeared on, the, on an episode of the Antiques Roadshow with a glockenspiel? That is not true. But if you believed Wikipedia in 2004, it was true. Oh, right, because that, yeah. was, that was written on there. That was written on there. I don't know where that came from. Well, I did appear in, <laughs> I did appear in Steven Spielberg's War Horse. I was an extra in that film. Oh, if wow. You watch, yes. if you, if, yeah, if you watch that film, I worked for an extras agency for a while. And if you watch that film, there are a few scenes where there's some officers doing officer stuff, you know, planning the planning the... This has suddenly gone to like World War One theme of this. <laughs> but that, then if you watch that, then uh, I was on. I was a. Uh, I was an, an extra in that. 
Oh, amazing. I remember watching that, yeah. Yeah, oh, it was it was a pretty intense. It was actually pretty intense because they had the whole setup there, like the like the trenches. And you, obviously, you, you, in uniform, you have to go over the top. Explosions. Yeah, it was, it was good. Okay. Yeah, because someone else was asking about what you've been up to since since the band. Uh, what other, what other stuff are you in then? In terms of well, extras? I, I mean. What, what other what other stuff I was in? I yeah. just I did that, and then I was in um, what else was was I in? I, Captain America. I was in that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Where was that? From? I was. I was. Yeah. I was the the body double for Captain America. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it was. Um, I think I was a scientist that had to wear a lab coat in that one. Okay. Um, but the 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 war horse one, I had. Um, I was one of my. One of my, they, they go through there sometimes and they're looking for someone and say, okay, we need someone to do this scene, you know, not an actor, one of the extras. And they said to me, look, okay, you, what we need you to do now, the camera's going to be panning across and you're going to put your head up over the trench and you're going to see this horse, okay, and you're going to be, you're going to be seeing this horse and the camera's going to be looking at you, okay, can you do that? I said, yeah, great, okay, I'll do this. This, is, this could be it, my big break, okay. So I get, get ready. Steven Spielberg's there, you know, the whole crew, it's all ready, the whole thing. And I come up, you come over the top of the trench, camera pans, and then they're like, now whistle, whistle. I can't whistle. I can't whistle. So I'm sort of like this, and the camera's <laughs> rolling. And then Steven Spielberg just says, cut. And that was it. That was it. That was my, that was my moment of fame. <laughs> wow. That's so, mad, getting directed by yeah. Spielberg himself. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, that was it. it. I did a couple of couple of things like that. But if I would have whistled, then I would have been my big, <laughs> big moment. What happened? Did they did they add the whistle in or something? No, they did. I think someone else did. It. <laughs> ah, okay, right, right. It's funny because obviously watching like Ricky Gervais's extras, you get an idea of. Yeah. How ruthless it is, kind of thing. Yeah, it's ruthless. Yeah, it's very ruthless, and I mean, it's like. Yeah, this, the, the thing is, I mean, I, I I didn't do this. This I did it because I got my wife got an email that said anybody who is free to do this, they're looking for people to do German do German soldiers, and I thought, like, okay, uh, I'll do okay, it. right. And, and then in the end, it ended up you doing all these different roles, these different play, playing these different soldiers from different different times. But the um, that I didn't do it thinking, okay, I'm going to be an actor out of this or anything like that. But there are a lot of people as that. That's that whole thing, isn't it? Of that extra show, we really want to be. They want their big big break. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I saw you posting about your band, Bonnie Lass. When did when did that come around? Yeah, that was that was um, something that I did with Gabriel. Uh, we used to be a metronomy. Um, that was oh, we did that. Eight. It was when it was, I don't know, 2013, something like that, when, when I was still in London. And we got together, we wrote some songs together, and then we then it was just sitting there. And then in lockdown, Gabriel actually said, well, why don't we just put it out? So we did. So that's up, up on, on the band, band camp. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, and then I, I Googled you, and uh, you came up on a website called Spiders Web Film, and it said... Uh, you were um, a songwriter with various artists and composing for film. Is that right? Yeah. Well, what I mean, what I've done since now, actually, my main job is a teacher. I'm teaching okay, at a right. school in in the town where where I live. But since I've always kept doing music in some way, and that um, yeah, that film is a friend of mine. He's a bit of filmmaker. So I did some. So whenever he's got a film and he needs some new some music then I'll do something and that's obviously like instrumental stuff using my, my, using my stuff at home using the, the recording stuff I've got at home and then I've been and since yeah at the end of the regs I did do a bit of songwriting with people as well so I've got a few songs that, that are out there apart from the regs yeah okay cool yeah and I was enjoying your uh, your 8-bit version of Binary Love as well oh yeah yeah that, <laughs> that, I, that I had to put up there I thought that was um Again, I did that a while ago. When I must have had more time on the hand. <laughs> no, it sounds ass to be fair. And like yeah, there's, there's some remixes of uh, different songs, wasn't there? Did uh, 
was it Tim Galsworth that did, that did a remix of that? Yeah, they did. They did. I think they did Binary Love remix, and the Filthy Dukes did the Twenty Two Grand Job one. Um, uh, what else was there? There was quite a few. None of them, to be honest, was which I was like, oh yeah, this is amazing. I mean, we and as as I as I posted as well, I did a remix. One remix I did myself was of that Gang of Four track. Yeah, um, and that was that was good fun to do. Yeah, 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 cool. And yeah, I mean, do you speak to the rest of the band? Like, do you get on well with them still? Obviously. Yeah, I still. I mean, not not that regularly, but um, still definitely in touch with with the with the guys. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to uh, Lassa's restaurant yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. No, I haven't been there. I haven't I haven't I haven't visited him doing his thing there. But it's got, <laughs> you know, I think it's you know whenever. I, you know, it's nice to, to stay in touch with the boys, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Mel, I really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. We'll finish on a, a couple of those questions I sent you. Like, yeah, is, is there anything, you've mentioned it already, but is there anything you would do differently, do you think? I think, yeah, I think the the, the whole idea of that second record and just I'm talking a point, point of view of writing songs. I'm not talking about playing live or anything like that, just purely writing songs. Maybe would have tried to come at it from a different different place, a different just to try and do something a bit a bit different on that second record. Um that yeah, that that I'd say maybe the video thing. Yeah, not take and also although we did we did um we did have we did have this I think pretty healthy sense of humour about it all, not take it all too seriously, you know. The, 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 the all these things that happen when you're in a band, I think it's being in doing that was a real privilege to actually be able to get on, to to play music with, for people. Uh, you know, it really was. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, I don't know if you've got one, but like just like I mentioned, a, a Gallagher brother story or just a funny story to finish on, even though I've got a few already, but. No, that's, yeah, I definitely that's great. The Gallagher thing. Well, yeah, I've I've prepared something here. For you. Right. <laughs> what it what it was was we did we I've, actually that's one of my regrets. We never got slagged off by Liam Gallagher. <laughs> that is that is it. You know, if you know you've made it, then if you're playing guitars um, or, or or anything, but especially guitar bands, you're getting slagged off by Liam. That's it. You know, you're on the radar. You you're up there. But he never did. So that, that, I guess, is the most we got was a shrug from Noel because we played, we played a TV show. I can't remember the name of the TV show. Noel was on there. It, was, it, was, it wasn't, um, it was with Tim Lovejoy, but it wasn't the Saturday morning one. It was a different one. Anyway, Noel was there. We played Strasbourg live to a live audience. Tim Lovejoy says to Noel, what do you think, Noel? Noel shrugs. <laughs> yeah classic isn't it <laughs> sure so um and i'd had a job next to the bbc in um in central london and i remember seeing noel outside having a fag i said all right Noel," and he said all right that was it <laughs> that, that's another noel gallagher story that i've got and when we were in Tokyo, we played that Tokyo gig you mentioned. Then we had a, um, there was, Le no, o Oasis were headlining that. And the backstage area was a really big backstage area. And, you know, you had to different points where people were doing interviews and hospitality and all that stuff. And then literally it was almost like the, the parting of the Red Sea. People sort of moved away, out of the way. And then coming down the, Middle, there's Liam, you know, with bodyguards, <laughs> sunglasses on. Yeah, doing his, yeah, that was it, you know, Liam Gallagher on on form. Didn't say anything, just walked along. <laughs> but um, Being Liam, yeah. yeah. Being Liam, yeah, being Liam, yeah. And, yeah, the other thing that I, we, we, which we didn't, we never got to do was play on top of the pops. Uh, okay, right. Because first, I mean, Obviously, you've got to, I don't know what the, by the time we were, I think it had finished, because we definitely had some, we had some songs in the top, certainly we, we were, 
nudging the top 20 there we might have even had a song that was in the top 20 so we could have been we could have been on there we you know we filled the criteria so uh, that would have been good to go on top of the pops then i could uh, then i could put that on my stone was <laughs> on top of the pops but uh, um uh yeah, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't get. To, we would have mimed as well. You got. I think miming would have been best. <laughs> well, I just go the full hog, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Because when we did when we did Jules Holland, and we played, I think we were like a really good live band. The rates, I think, coming to see us live was probably the main. That was where we were in our element. But uh, um, so when we did that Jules Holland show, played twenty two grand job. It's all well and good, but it just it doesn't work the same way as it did you know, at a live gig.